So, I don't know what the fuck I just read, but I know I liked it. And that's typically my reaction to reading anything Jonathan Hickman writes, and I'm glad that this first issue follows that tradition. You're now watching The Mystical Green Beanie. Hey, what's going on dudes and dudettes? I am the Mystical Green Beanie, and today I wanted to talk about the first issue of House of X by Jonathan Hickman, Pepe Larraz, Marte Garcia, Clayton Cowles, and Tom Mueller. And I guess I should start off by admitting that I haven't read an X-Men comic in over five years? I mean, like, I, I've kept up with X-Men from watching other YouTubers talk about recent storylines and whatnot, but I haven't read the X-Men since... I want to say the Guardians of the Galaxy Trial of Jean Grey crossover. Uh, it, like, that's when I tapped out. And, yeah. Uh, I'm guessing a lot's happened in the past five years. Apparently Xavier's back from the dead and can walk again. And from the looks of it, I think his mission statement has changed. Uh, so, before we go any further, I want to issue a massive spoiler warning and urge anyone who hasn't read this book to leave this video right now Go to your local comic book store, or, you know, digital comic app or whatever, read the first issue of House of X, and then come back. Because I really, I really want to have a discussion with you guys about this. Alright, so, I'm pretty sure it's still too early to tell, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that Hickman's run on the X-Men is gonna be the sequel that Grant Morrison's X-Men run deserved. And I do want to talk about Morrison's X-Men at some point in time, because... I do love that run, and for me, it is a decent stopping point for the X-Men, but this first issue right here... Okay, wh wh where, where do I start? Uh, so, remember when we first started getting promo art for House of X, and uh, I thought the guy with the giant X-Dome on his head was the Maker, because, you know, Ultimate Universe MGTOW Reed Richards wear similar headgear? Uh, but according to this issue, it's Charles Xavier. And from the looks of it, I think the mission has changed. So you know how originally Charles Xavier's big dream was for humans and mutants to coexist in this world? Well, it looks like that might not be the case anymore. So going back to Grant Morrison for a second, at the beginning of he and Frank Quietly's run, it's established that humanity is dying. And within a few generations, mutants would not only become the ethnic majority, they'd be the dominant species. Okay, that might be a little redundant, but you, you get what I'm saying. However, this was stilted by the Genosian Genocide, where over 16 million mutants were murdered by Cassandra Nova. And then came Hickman. Uh, so, according to Dr. Alia Gregor, a new character created by Hickman and Laraz in this issue, uh, the Beast assessment was wrong. Humanity wasn't going to die out in a few generations. Humanity only had 10 or so years. Or much rather, they would have if Genosha wasn't attacked. Now, humanity faces extinction in 20 years, which is why I'm guessing that in this book, Professor Xavier's mind has changed. And it's not that he's against humanity, like Magneto was for so many years. In fact, he introduces three new drugs to the human race. Drug L, which extends the human lifespan by five years. Drug I, which is basically penicillin after it enters Super Saiyan 6541 Run Barrier Run Ultra Instinct God Mode. And Drug M, which can cure any degenerative brain disease within humans and humans only, which I think is interesting. And starting five months ago, all of the mutants under Charles Xavier's command started planting these special flowers made from Krakoa, who, last I checked, was the sentient lawn for the X-Mansion. And uh, they plant these flowers around the Marvel Universe, which transform into giant gateways that lead to the island of Krakoa, which is hidden somewhere in the Pacific Ocean with Krokoa himself being used as uh, a promised land of sorts for mutants. And apparently, these gateways only respond to mutants, which means that humans can't enter Krokoa through them, at least not without permission. And I, I, I don't know, I, I suppose that in light of the rapid reemergence of mutants, Xavier's goal has shifted from human-mutant integration to focusing on ushering his people into the future while trying to make humanity's last remaining years comfortable while keeping the peace between both species. And 
I'm really interested in seeing how Xavier came to that conclusion. And I don't know. I, I guess I want to get inside his head a little more. Okay, that was lame. I'm sorry. I'll stop. But there is this notion that's present. And it doesn't come from Charles. It comes from Magneto, which I also made note of. And it's on the last page of the issue where he's talking about religious symbolism and how important it is to humanity. And he addresses why he invited the government agents who represent the audience in this issue to the Jerusalem habitat. He wanted to make a point that mutants are humanity's new gods. And I love that because once again, uh, that's something that tracks from Morrison's run, where Magneto doesn't even recognize human religion. He's disgusted by it because it's a part of human culture, which I'm interested to see if that sparks any tension between he and Charles as the series progresses. And that's also something that I picked up on as well, uh, this notion of mutant culture, again, coming from Morrison. But in this issue alone, Hickman expands on that concept Hell, the man invented a mutant language. Like, one that can only be understood after it's telepathically stamped into your brain. This issue also establishes that there is a super secret doomsday organization known as Orcus, and their primary goal is to stave off human extinction. And apparently, Orcus is the brainchild of both government agencies, as well as known terrorist organizations within the Marvel Universe. And they've built this facility, a habitat really, uh, specifically designed for the preservation of the human population called the Forge. And I love the symbolism of the facility being a sentinel head. Just something about that is really provocative. It's like watching a white family who's the descendant of slave owners take refuge on the Amistad. I don't know, it, it really hit me, and I'm interested to see where that all goes. Hickman also causes some friction between uh, the mutants and the Fantastic Four because, of course, Franklin Richards of the Fantastic Four is a mutant, and Cyclops offers his parents uh, to keep an open mind about letting their son join them on Krakoa. And I think this is going to be really important down the line because not only does Cyclops make that suggestion after they've had a heated debate about amnesty regarding a few well-known mutant criminals who stole some supplies and technology from uh, the Damage Control Headquarters, but there's also a chart that lists off Omega Level Mutants and their affiliations, and Franklin Richards is on that list, and he's the only mutant on there that's affiliated with humanity. As far as what was stolen from Damage Control, I, I don't know, we'll have to wait and see in later issues. Uh, but I do think it's interesting how Damage Control is now owned by Tony Stark and Reed Richards, uh, who used the facility as a glorified storage unit for their projects. Oh, and one last thing before I start talking about the art. Uh, in the beginning of this issue, we see Professor Xavier standing at the center of Krakoa, surrounded by a bunch of pods full of trademarked LCL, and from them emerges the X-Men. And this brings into question, are these the original X-Men? Are they clones? Is Professor X really Professor X? Dude, I, I don't know. And I love the fact that I don't know. And again, this is just one of those situations where I can't wait to see what Hickman and company has in store for us. Now, moving on to the art by Pepe Larraz and Marte Garcia. Oh my god! Wow! This art is gorgeous. It's like watching a painting in motion. Uh, from the breathtaking scenery, to the dynamic poses that characters will have drawing your eye down the page, to the kinetic yet brief action sequences. I was hooked on this book visually about as much as I was with the narrative. And this is one of those situations where the art really enhanced the overall storytelling of the comic's narrative. Although I will admit that there were some pages where I got stuck because I just, I couldn't stop gawking at the pretty pictures on the page. I also think it's interesting some of the designs that Pepe Larraz has for some of the characters in this book, uh, particularly Xavier's redesign. And I think this might just be a Hickman thing. Because I know for a fact that he has a thing for characters wearing weird things on their faces. But I also just like the overall design of Professor X, as well as some of the other mutants' costumes. Uh, Sophie and Esme's designs were really simple and great. I also like seeing Jean Grey in her old 80s costume. Cyclops continues to wear a full body condom, which 
I don't know, that was never really my favorite look for him, but Laraz draws it in a way that I think it looks alright, and Garcia's colors help. And I really like the new AIM uniforms. I don't know, just something about them looks cool. Maybe it's the fact that they're wearing red and not R. Kelly yellow, but something about the design really spoke to me. But yeah guys, uh, that was the first issue of House of X. Dude, I am excited for the future of X-Men. Like, for real. After so many years of the X-Men ranging from being mediocre to just straight up and down bad, this really... it... I felt like Hickman was giving me an apology hug on behalf of Marvel Comics. And if you're like me and you fell off the X-Men wagon a few years ago, or worse, haven't read the X-Men in years, I honestly think this is a good starting point. I, there are a few things here and there that might be confusing for newer readers or returning readers, but I'm sure you'll catch up. Same as the rest of us. Anyways, those are my thoughts, but what about you? Uh, what did you think of this issue? Did you like it? Did you not like it? Are you confused? Uh, let me know down below in the comments section. Also, if you like this video, hit the like button to support the channel, and if you want to see more content like this, all you have to do is subscribe. I'm the Mystical Green Beanie, thanks for watching, and as always, until next time, adios nachos, adios.